For those in the audience, welcome to another ERC uh, kind of thought leadership piece um, with Glenn Hubbard. Um, and it's a great pleasure to have you uh, here this morning for you, this evening, this evening for us. And thank you for making time in your busy schedule. Kind of as I think you said, you're in, in Orlando. Um, before we get started, um, obviously, the ERC, we've got another, um, we've got up and coming events. Thank you for all of those who took part in Clash of the Titans. Um, and uh, so please look at our website for the uh, up, up and coming events over the next uh, over the next couple of months. And this is recorded, so please do share it with friends and kind of and family. Obviously, kind of ERC kind of membership. Glenn, it's a great pleasure to welcome you uh, uh, here today this evening. Um, Glenn's going to be talking about his new book, The Wall and Bridge, which is how um, Adam Smith will be talking to us today, I suppose, or an interpretation interpretation of. Um, and um, really, without further ado, oh, before I do that, um, if there's any questions, please, you know, uh, email, WhatsApp, uh, David, um, or put them in the chat box, and we'll pick them up towards the end. And Glenn, Glenn's talk is going to be kind of half an hour, and then we'll move into kind of Q and A towards the towards the end of that. Um, so, without further ado, the mic is the mic is yours. Well, thank you so much uh, for having me this evening. It's it's a real pleasure to be with you. Uh, I will be indeed talking about a book I wrote recently called uh, The Wall and the Bridge, which in a sense takes up the subject of why I became an economist in the first place. I was very interested in economic growth, uh, both how growth starts and in another book I wrote a few years ago, Balance, How Growth Stops. And the political economy of growth is interesting, you know, often um, policymakers tend to have either a science view of growth, that it's all about particular innovations and technology. Economists, of course, we have a different story of growth, which I'll, I'll come to. But one of the things that's increasingly concerned me is more the political economy of growth, not whether the pace of science will permit growth or whether we understand in economics enough of how to model growth, but whether growth can withstand the political uh, process. The, the way I like to think about this is that economists are bad at noticing uh, something in particular, big changes uh, in society uh, and its equilibrium. And, and to, to set the stage, one of the metaphors I use in the book is actually the question the late Queen of England uh, asked at the London School of Economics pretty much at the onset of the financial crisis her Majesty had gone to the London School of Economics, I believe, to, to um, open up a new building uh, and then asked a rather devastating question. My friend Luis Garacano, another economist, was tasked with writing the Queen back in answer. Her question was very simple but very powerful. Why did nobody see it coming? Mm -hmm. And I think what the Queen meant was not second guessing. After all, some people said they saw the financial crisis. Many did not. I think what the Queen meant was how is it that there are slow moving, very large events that ought to be of prominent concern to the profession and we weren't paying attention, we weren't noticing? I argue in the book that one of those very big things uh, is about growth itself. Oddly enough, growth is under attack from many even conservative voices uh, in, in the West at a time when it matters uh, a lot. Uh, to give you an example, I teach principally in a business school, although also in an economics department, a very good business school, so my students are going to do very well. I taught a class in political economy a year ago where many of the students questioned capitalism itself, and I, I used the metaphor from a movie not familiar to them, but to my generation, Life of Brian, a Monty Python movie, where I said, you know, in the movie, they say, well, what did the Romans ever do for us? And then they list, of course, thousands of things the Romans did, and I said, that's what capitalism is. Now, growth has always fascinated economists. Bob Lucas, when he won the Nobel Prize, said, you know, once you start thinking about economic growth as an economist, it's very difficult to think of anything else, largely for the obvious reasons that small changes in economic growth have large changes in living standards. My teacher, Ben Friedman, wrote very well in a book called The Moral Consequences of Economic Growth, that growth isn't just about incomes. It's about the kind of society we have. The growing societies are more likely to be open culturally, less racist, less xenophobic, less anti-Semitic, all good things. But here's the issue in which I start the book. Imagine I'm holding a coin and the head side of the coin is growth. Now, 
who could be opposed to growth. I mean, perhaps some in the environmental movement, but mostly we all say we're for growth. But like every coin with a heads, there's tails. And the tails is disruption and change. There is no modern theory of economic growth that works the way we sometimes tell freshman students in economics. That is, there's this sort of nice linear or log linear growth in an economy. That's not how it works. Modern theories of growth entail disruption and change. Now, the problem with that, of course, is that disruption isn't generally Pareto improving. Uh, some people win handsomely from the disruption. Uh, others lose quite a bit. Net-net, as a society, we're ahead. But that's very different than a Pareto improving change. And so when economists come to talking about growth, we usually default to whether we're optimistic or pessimistic about science uh, and its pace. When I taught at Northwestern University at the beginning of my career, my office was between the two men at the epicenter of this debate, Bob Gordon, who thinks that we've accomplished all we're ever going to accomplish. And the way I just said it tells you what I think of that argument. And my colleague, Joel Mokir, a historian of the Industrial Revolution, who said, no, 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 we're, we're only at the, at the beginning argue in the book that that's not really the question. I, I lean more toward the optimists, but I don't think that's the question. Rather, the question is about political economy. And, and to put it on the table, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a story. About 20 years ago, uh, I was the chief economic advisor to then President Bush, who uh, put steel tariffs uh, in the US economy. Uh, not surprising for an economist, I was extremely against that idea and told him so, only one of his advisors to voice an objection. When I went to meet him the morning he was to decide, my wife reminded me that the world essentially has two groups of people, economists and real people. And she said, you are an economist. The president is definitely a real person. Be careful. So I didn't go in with what every Econ 101 professor says, which openness is good, trade is good, all the things that are true and your Econ 101 professor told you. Rather, I went in with two charts. The first chart showed a declining labor share. And the president said, you know, that's the decline in manufacturing jobs I'm trying to stop. And I said, no, sir, I, I just showed you agriculture 1900 to 1940. Do you want to put them all back to work on the farm? And I could tell from his look that I had gotten somewhere. And then I showed him another chart of job losses by county in the United States, each American state subdivided into counties. And he said, you know, that's odd because I'm, I'm protecting jobs. And I said, no, sir, you don't go to the grocery store and buy steel. It's an input into other things. And therefore what you've done is just cost jobs elsewhere in manufacturing. Now I thought I had won the day. Uh, he decided exactly the opposite. I went back in and he said to me, you know, I agree with everything you said. And I said, well, funny that you decided exactly the opposite. And he said, you know, let me explain something to you. I, made, I, President Bush, made a speech when I was Governor Bush on the campaign trail in Wheeling, West Virginia, which is an American city, very rundown and, and uh, suffering from uh, disruptions from technology and from globalization. He said, I went there and I told him I could make it better. And you and other economists like you, you didn't give me any other alternative. From that moment on, I've been thinking about the political economy of growth. And, and after all, it, the right place to think is, is back to Adam Smith. While Smith isn't a scholar of growth, I'll, I'll come to that, he definitely had the radical idea that got us all thinking as economists that openness and competition are always worth the candle. That is the radical insight that it's the overall size of the pie the ability of average people to consume. That's the wealth of a nation standing the then um, popular view of mercantilism uh, on its head. It would be the consumer that would be uh, the sovereign, not the king. One of the things that's interesting about that Smithian argument, which is well known to certainly most economic students and even policy makers, is that it's very incomplete. Smith, uh, is generally thought of by means of that argument as advocating for laissez-faire. 
which isn't really a fair reading of Smith, even in the wealth of, of nations. Smith has a number of roles of government that I'll, I'll come back to momentarily. But particularly what interested me about Smith is to go back to his book that he felt was his better work, which is, of course, the theory of moral sentiments. And Smith uses again and again in the book the phrase mutual sympathy, which to today's ears would probably be empathy, not just the average size of the pie, as economists interpret the wealth of, the, of nations, but making sure that everyone comes along, or what my colleague in the econ department at Columbia, Ned Phelps, a Nobel laureate, refers to as mass flourish, which I think is a very felicitous Smithian phrase. Now, Smith didn't have a theory of growth. He had a theory about the level of output. But modern theories of growth build on the similar insights that openness to change, be it from technology, which is very nascent uh, in the decades after the wealth of nations, uh, or, or in today's world, globalization. Uh, since uh, 1800, there's been about a 30-fold increase in living standards in the UK and uh, the US. And of course, many goods and services that we eagerly consume today were not available even 50 years ago, let alone uh, in, in 1800. One of the things that's nice about modern treatments of growth is the centrality of openness to change and innovation. Again, I think my, of my colleague, Ned Phelps. Uh, I also think of the economic historian, Deirdre McCloskey or, or Joel Mokir. It's really unlikely in that world that economic slowdowns uh, and problems and innovation are going to be due to scientific barren, barrenness, but really more to walls uh, against openness uh, and change. So here's the rub. Every Econ 101 professor tells his or her students that when you have openness to either a change in technology or change in the market, for example, through globalization or trade, there are significant gains to be had. I'm quite confident the professor reminded the students that not everybody benefits, but usually some incantation of Caldor's words is presented to the students to say, but of course gainers could compensate the losers because the size of the pie uh, is now bigger to use the, the, Smithian, uh, the Smithian frame. The problem is of course that that hasn't happened. And Mercantilism is back uh, around the world, certainly in the U.S., even among the more conservative party, traditionally the Republican Party in the U.S., many politicians and the advisors they have say that Smith could be turned on his head, that basically uh, we shouldn't care about the total consumption or consumption of an average person. We should care about production and even particular producers, you know, a very anti Smithian view, and the economics profession has done too little, in my view, to, to punch back. That has also burrowed into thinking in both the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, on the role of business. You know, I, a couple of years ago, I had the privilege of being asked to write a 50th anniversary essay on Milton Friedman's famous uh, op-ed piece in the New York Times, where he said the purpose of business is to maximize its profits. That struck many then and now as cold. I went through my essay explaining what Friedman meant and the circumstances under which that made perfect sense and the circumstances under which it does not. But that view of the world is, is quite a bit um, under attack. Walls are the most familiar political economy antidote to this problem. Uh, think about how many politicians around the world uh, have said, if you don't like the damage done by openness, we can reverse it. Brexit in the United Kingdom, the building of a physical wall along the southern border of the United States, uh, concerns about immigrants, concerns about trade, concerns about cultures that aren't the same as the domestic economy, whether one is speaking in purely economic terms, the damage is there, or in cultural terms, uh, Pache, my teacher, Ben Friedman, and the moral consequences, this is indeed a very, very serious uh, situation. The problem is this. It's easy to see why the wall has a great deal of resonance. 
when President Bush went to Wheeling, West Virginia, as a presidential candidate, he no doubt said something to the effect of, I'm going to make it right. I'm going to bring back the prosperity you once had. For years, I have taken groups of Columbia students to two cities in, in America. One is Youngstown, Ohio, which is right in the heartland of our country. It is um, an old steel city. It was legendary in the steel business. It was disrupted principally by technological change. U.S. firms had been very sloppy in adopting um, technological advances in steel making. Globalization is blamed and certainly played a role, but was not, not the dominant role. Uh, another city that I take them to is Decatur, Alabama, uh, which was similarly uh, disrupted. And one of the reasons I do that goes back to the, the Queen's question about noticing. And it's very hard for people who think about economics, whether they're professional economists or like my students who will be business leaders or politicians acting on everyone's behalf to appreciate the losses uh, from disruption without having seen them uh, up and close. So the wall is easy. The wall is a soundbite. Build the wall was literally the soundbite of a president of the United States. Now there is an antidote to the wall and it's not what economists have been offering. If I think about the antidote for a wall, if you were to ask an economist on television let's say in the past decade through the rise of President Trump and through that era, what the problems with wall logic are, you would principally hear arguments that are either classically liberal, Smith and Ricardo, or you would hear uh, neoliberal arguments uh, from Friedman, who I mentioned before, or, or Friedrich Hayek. And you might well hear arguments that at least to an untrained ear sound very laissez-faire, that all we need to do is just allow openness and things will work out. Um, I remember the person I asked to succeed me in Washington, Greg Mankiw, a friend and another uh, economist, once said that he didn't care whether it was semiconductor chips or potato chips. And once economists start talking like that, people tune us out. Something seems very odd to them. And so, I think the antidote to the wall is not neoliberalism. The antidote to a wall is a bridge. Now, the reason I picked the bridge uh, to, to fill out the metaphor is a bridge by construction takes you over something, you know, either a, a body of water or some troubled terrain, or it can bring you back. In the context of growth and disruption, what a bridge is, is either preparing you for the society that is and will be, in other words, going back to the Wheeling, West Virginia example, not I'm going to make it 1955 again, but I'm going to actually help you live in the world that you and your children live in today. Another type of bridge bringing you back is one of reconnection or an econ speak social insurance. Most of our social insurance programs for labor, at least in the United States, were designed for a very different problem. They were designed for problems at a business cycle frequency. So programs like say unemployment insurance, mean if I have a short-term loss of my job, I get a fraction of my wages back until the business cycle turns up and then I get another job. Of course, with structural change from technological advance and globalization, the issue for many uh, people is less, am I going to have my wages or employment prospects rise or fall with the business cycle, but whether my job exists or whether I have a skill that enables me to participate in that world. Now, candidly, what must a bridge be? If it's about preparation or reconnection, what in the real world of policy is, uh, is a bridge? Let me first start off uh, with two American examples, one of definitely what it's not and the other what I think it can be. What it's not is what we've actually done in recent decades. So in the United States, there's a program called Trade Adjustment Assistance. When President Kennedy uh, wanted to have a bold new trade round uh, for the United States, uh, he pushed through Congress a program called Trade Adjustment Assistance that said, if I uh, lost my job because of a foreign competitor, non-American competitor, I could get some assistance. Now, perhaps, nine people in a chicken ever benefited from trade adjustment assistance. In fact, when I worked in Washington twice, once 
is chief economist in the Treasury Department, the other is chief economist in the White House. The only time I ever heard the program mentioned was when we, those were conservative Republican administrations, when we wanted trade promotion authority, we touted it, but nobody ever benefited from it. That kind of cynicism is well understood by the public. And let alone, should I care whether I lost my job because a non-American company is successful as opposed to a domestic American technology? I don't see why it even, even makes a difference. We actually did, though, once know how to do this. The two examples I talk through in the book, uh, I deliberately pick one president from each of our major political parties, uh, Abraham Lincoln and uh, Franklin Roosevelt. And for Lincoln, you know, Lincoln, of course, was president during the nation's civil war. People don't usually think about Lincoln in economic policy, but quite interestingly, in the middle of the existential crisis of the nation, Lincoln pushes through an agenda of the Transcontinental Railroad, the Homestead Act, opening up land to landless Americans, and what I focus on the book, the, the Morrill Act, which was the creation of land-grant colleges in the United States. The intuition Lincoln had in all of these was that the role of government was to be muscular, but not in the sense of social insurance, in the sense of um, being a battering ram for opportunity. I focus on the Morrill Act and land-grant colleges because the U.S. at the time was undergoing a transition from agriculture to manufacturing. And part of the goal of the land-grant colleges was to train young men and women, and yes, women, that was part of the democratization in the land-grant college movement was to train women uh, as well as men. That was designed to facilitate economic change. It was done at a very large scale in today's words, you can think of it as being the equivalent of a large block grant from the central government to local governments to affect change. Uh, it was done in a way that still allowed local conditions to matter. Different states implemented land grant universities in different ways. It's a case study of a, a fairly significant part of the book, but it's, it's extremely important. I mentioned Franklin Roosevelt not as the architect of the so-called New Deal of the 1930s, but is the architect of the GI Bill of the 1940s. Uh, what Roosevelt had intuited was the many millions of men and some women who would be returning to America from military service in Europe and in the Far East would be returning to an economy that was different than the one they left. And it would be both a moral obligation to prepare them for that new economy, but also an important political economy obligation because we want broad support for the system. So the GI Bill was designed to massively support the re-education of men and women who returned from the military. We have done this and done it at scale. In, in the book, I talk about ways in which these actions of the past can be flesh in the future. Um, two ideas on preparation that I go into just to economize on, on time a bit. One in the US setting are what are called community colleges. So the, if you think of tertiary education in the United States, they're traditional four-year universities, but they're also two-year universities that either prepare young people for a transition for more college education or more often than not, directly for work. They are the principal uh, institutions for providing basic skills, not only to young people, but to people who have lost their jobs in middle age who come back to uh, attain new skills. They're very underfunded. And so drawing on the Morrill Act, the land-grant college movement, uh, I suggest with a, another economist, and I write about it in the book, Austin Goolsby, who's a colleague, uh, a program of a large block grant for community college, the Morrill Act of the 21st century instead of the, the 19th century. Another in preparation is to make work pay. My colleague Ned Phelps in his wonderful book, Rewarding Work, talks about the need to subsidize work. And Ned talks about subsidies to labor demand. In the US, we already have programs that provide direct income supports linked to work, the so-called earned income tax credit. So in the book, I talk about ways to reform that. In reconnection, uh, two things that I put on the table. One are what I call personal reemployment accounts uh, for people who have um, the likelihood of being long-term uh, unemployed. Those accounts would be used to fund support, fund training, 
without reliance on one size fits all government programs. And then something that's heresy to many economists, which is place-based aid. There's a standard mind's eye of economists that, well, why don't people just move to jobs? I happen to be here this afternoon to give a, a speech in Orlando, Florida. This place is booming. So why don't people just leave Youngstown, Ohio and just all move to Orlando? Well, that isn't happening. Uh, and it hasn't happened for decades. And so the question is, if we're serious about the political economy of the heartland, not only of this country, but other countries, we need to think hard about sensible place-based aid. We can talk about it in Q&A if you like, but I suggest some proposals there. What's the role of business in all of this? It's, it's quite interesting because one of the premises of Friedman's argument about business and its focus on profit maximization wasn't just the implicit assumptions that all markets are perfectly competitive, even though he doesn't say that. It's the assumption that there's broad social support for business. And so all we're doing is fighting around the edges about uh, the extent we would, re would regulate or the marginal tax rate uh, on profits or things like that. I actually don't think that's accurate. I think the social support for business is much flimsier uh, than Friedman suggests, or perhaps flimsier than it was in 1970 when he, when he wrote the piece. Many, particularly young employees tell CEOs that we don't think government is working and therefore we think you should step in. Now as economists, we would say, be very careful with that. If part of what we mean by government not working is a failure to fix say externalities like climate change, no CEO can step in and, and fix that. But the, the fact that this subject comes up tells you how much it's on people's mind. And then for government, I remind the reader that we need a government to focus on this more like Lincoln did with opportunity. The answer to the Queen's question about why nobody saw any of this coming, why could we have globalization and technological change over the past several decades and not understand that we would get these pressures means we're simply not organized to, to combat some of the downsides of structural change as well as we're organized to celebrate their considerable uh, benefits. I think when my MBA students say, that they have doubts about capitalism. It is not that they are embracing socialism, at least as economists would use that term. Rather, I think it's they're looking for proof that capitalism can work the way Smith said it would work, that it was not only going to raise um, consumption on average, the size of the pie, it would be uh, mass flourishing. So to wind up, I think we don't want to abandon pro-growth policy, an essential element of which is openness to change, whether it's technology, whether it's globalization. Uh, and I don't think we should simply be saying the right answer to anybody who says build a wall is let's just have limited government or a night watchman state. I think rather we need to think about a more robust economic response for how we prepare people and attach them to work. And, and I say that not because I'm a Calvinist Presbyterian, although I am. I say it because work is an incredibly important part of people's dignity and participation. Smith talks a lot about participation in society. And I think that's a big part of, of what, he, what he meant. I would just wind up by saying that, you know, President Trump had a, a slogan that's emblazoned on red hats MAGA, make America great again. For my students, when I teach political economy, I write on the board shocking them because like most students, they're quite liberal uh, in the American sense of the word. I write on the board N and then A with an asterisk GA and tell them the asterisk means Adam Smith. Make Adam Smith great again and I'll stop there. That's great. I've got loads of, you can't stop there. There's a lot of, a lot of questions hey, coming in uh, from messages as well as uh, um, uh, uh, just sheer interest. And, um, you know, I've got so many kind of on the forefront of my mind in terms of what was it like to work under Bush? I think we were for three years. But um, just, just coming back to the book, obviously, you know, the wall and the bridge, fear and opportunity uh, kind of in the, in the wake of obviously kind of disruption. Um, what was the original inspiration behind it for you? As in what was the, what was the kind of pivotal moment of, uh, of to, to kind of to go out and, uh, and write it? 
Well, it's, it's interesting. It's the events leading up to uh, President Trump's election in America and the first trips that I then took students on to Youngstown. Um, my brother is a very successful country Western singer in the United States. And so he would always remind me, um, even a decade ago, that, you know, Glenn, you spend all your time in New York and Washington and Cambridge, Massachusetts. I spend my time in America. And people don't think as positively about the things you think are so great for our economy. One of the reasons I wrote the book is when I started talking to more people in Youngstown about their views of what had gone right and what had gone wrong, I didn't sense an anger as much as a disappointment that business leaders, economists, policymakers, you know, we were sticking to our guns, but we weren't helping them to go back to the to the Bush question. So it was really an answer, uh, an answer to that. And in part, because I am very interested in politics, I think we cannot as a profession think that we're going to fight the wall with laissez-faire. That's never going to work. Even if we believed it, which I don't, but even if you did, that's not going to be the winner. The winner has to be a bridge. And how, then the question is, how do you articulate it? And of course, the wall was a very famous part of Trump's election campaign, right. Build the Wall. Right, which matched naturally, and that kind of leads into kind of immigration and the ne negative impacts of immigration. Right. Also, the huge positive impacts of immigration that has benefited America and kind of. Around. Well, yeah, that's the thing about immigration. It's if you think about the issues the country faces today. First of all, if you look at high skilled immigration in the United States, it has long been an American success story. Fifty percent of my students are not Americans, and my dream would be that each and every one of them, if they wanted to could work in the United States. And it's not because I'm a nice person. I would love it if every smart person wanted to be in my country. Why wouldn't I? And so I, I don't understand that, uh, that fear. And we know that company formation, the awarding of Nobel prizes to Americans often go to immigrant talent. Uh, the country also needs immigrants if we are to grow at a rate that Americans would like to grow. We don't have enough growth in the domestic labor force. So for a variety of reasons, immigration is going to have to be on the, on the policy table. At the same time, one of the reasons I took students to Decatur, Alabama, was that they were struggling with waves of immigrants. And when you talk to, whether it's local school teachers, or let's say a church charity, or local labor unions, they were still very worried about uh, integration and assimilation, you know, not unreasonable concerns. So I I do think these problems are hard. One of the reasons the bridge is hard, the wall is so easy. You don't like it, I'm gonna make it go away. I'm just gonna stop the technology. That is so seductive. It of course doesn't happen. I, I talk in the book about many historical case studies of failed walls, be they physical or metaphorical, yet it's so easy to say, uh, building a bridge is harder. Well, I was gonna say, how can, kind of policymakers balance the need for kind of creating secure borders and then attract and retain skills, right? That's a, that's a, and the attraction piece is the, is the key part. And, you know, should they um, even kind of ha have, have secure borders? You know, well, I mean, it, it, securing the border is actually an example of, of an issue, typically among conservative economists, we've talked to public officials, we say, um, let's take the, an analogy for a, for, of a boat for what I'm about to do. Um, we say, let's be ready to speed up the boat with faster growth, better economic policy. We would be better off if we got more people in the boat first. And with securing the borders and immigration, a conservative policy for immigration that's likely to be successful would have to start with a plan for securing the border and reducing illegal immigration. The public isn't ready to have the conversation it needs to have until that happens, nor is the public ready for policies toward openness generally until they're assured that we're not leaving the domestic economy behind. We are going to help people adjust to that. So I, I think it's just a different pivot for economists. We're so used to talking about the speeding up of a boat without thinking of, well, wait, is everybody in it? That's um, I am sure your students um, are, have come across this technology, ChatGBT. Oh, of course. Uh, this is, this they probably a, are writing their papers with. 
<laughs> they're probably writing their papers with it. I was uh, I sit on a uh, advisory piece for Portsmouth University here in the UK, and they're they're really struggling with it as terms of how to regulate against it, how it could be used. Um, and uh, Elon Musk obviously has come out with a almost like a paper which is really speaks to what you you know what you're saying is, and he's basically saying build a wall, let's stop this technology coming through. How how, how do you? Uh, well, and I was asked that question at a speech I gave early this morning in Miami. Oh, and I'm very I sorry. Said, I'm very, it's a very topical, you know. This no, it's very topical. And, and I said, you know, when I teach political economy, I put up this slide where I say there's this radically disruptive technology that completely changes who has access to information, how communication happens, and it changes the social order. And the students say, yeah, I, I know it's time to talk about the social media companies. And then I flip the slide and show them the printing press and a picture of Gutenberg. So the invention of the printing press was radical. The church, the dominant institution at the time, didn't exactly like the idea that Not massively cool. massive production of alternative ideas could be out there. So we've seen this play before. Now, of course, the pace of change keeps increasing. I'm, I'm not being naive on that front, but I don't think moratoria are the answer. I think it's really coming to grips with both preparing people for that world and asking, are we going to have a world in which, whether it's chat, GPT, or any form of open source uh, AI, whether we're going to have enough competition to make markets smithy and reasonable? And I say that because you know, in, when you're talking about uh, AI, the ownership of data matters a lot. Traditionally, we think of technology, or at least I think of technology industries as being reasonably competitive because there's this constant um, platform competition over time. The companies we were worried about being dominant, say 20, 30 years ago, we're not worried about anymore. In a world where the ownership of data matters and the use of AI to exploit that data, I have a little bit more of a worry about competition. None of that tells me we ought to try to stop the competition. Because by the way, if, if, if we stop chat GPT, that doesn't mean China stops chat GPT. So, so I, I think the, go the goal is really to try to understand it and think clearly about it. But to me, this is the printing press and the church uh, all over again. There are voices who will say this is too fast. This is not the information flow we want, but we need to embrace it. How do you, um, just out of interest, how do you, with your students at Columbia, um, how do you delineate between what's created through AI and actually written by them uh, kind of directly? Because that's, that's one of the things that Portsmouth are finding very difficult. Well, it is difficult. And for all I know, the students are doing a lot. But I tell them, well, I can't necessarily tell, tell whether them. somebody is just a bad writer, which frankly, many students are. Uh, or chat BT, chat GPT, which is also not written so well. I may not be able to tell the difference, but I can say that intuitive flashes where I see something that changes the way I think about something because of a new and clever argument, that's extremely unlikely to be written by chat GPT, at least today. So for the kind of arguments that actually persuade and change, that intuition is important. Rather, I think of chat GPT or any um, AI tool is probably affirming the best of us. In other words, the 99th percentile person only benefits from that help. The concern is, and the political economy concern about this, is that more and more people may fear that their jobs are at risk. Yeah. When, I, when I take students to Youngstown, we're talking about people who have been steel workers. But now I could be talking about people who are lawyers, yeah, lawyers. or accountants. Yeah, you know, there's no reason that they're not going to be uh, disrupted. But then, I, I suppose the counter to that is that's how economies, the disruptive technology that comes through, and that's how we adapt and change, uh, kind of. And, no, exactly, and, and, exactly. And we're going to have to figure out how to deal with that rather than trying to wish it away. Some years ago, I, I also teach entrepreneurship, so I see a lot of interesting ventures, and I invested in a business, not a public company, called Fiscal Note, and and part of their um, mission was to go out, scrape the web for regulatory and tax intuition to really empower a general counsel and a corporation to be able to deal with this at the state and federal level in the United States. To me, that only empowers the company. It's, it's a good thing, although it probably means the company's paying a lot less to young lawyers who sat around reading reg books. 
but to me, that's that's positive change, and people will adapt. Yeah, I I, I totally agree. Look, looking from across the pond in terms of how you see, I mean, a hot topic obviously a year, a few quite a few years back was Brexit. Um, would you say that was? It'd be interesting to get your view on that. Would you say that's a nation deciding to build a wall versus a uh, versus a bridge in terms of extricate, extra extra extricating themselves from uh, from a a combined economy? Well, I mean, I'm only an American, so this is just a foreigner's observation. I would say it's a more nuanced than that. Uh, I think that European rules and regulations may have been limiting. That part I certainly support. I do think, though, that the throwing away of openness uh, to the European Union was certainly an, an economic mistake. And I, I actually think that many people who voted for Brexit probably understood they, the nation would be worse off. I, I think this is part of the problem in the U.S. too. I, economists like to say, well, these people are just stupid. They don't understand. I, I think they do understand. It's the simple intuition, though, that I wasn't benefiting from many of the gains. Mm. And I was bearing all the costs. So spare me your sermons about how aggregate GDP would be higher if we were integrated with the European Union or if America, uh, you know, had better trade policy. So I think it's it's quite nuanced. I think both nations would benefit a lot from investing more in people to prepare them. In the UK, the discussion, long term discussion of leveling up is more of a discussion, I think, than it is. You know, true action. And in the US, we've done very little in terms of place-based aid, despite every politician's incantation. So actually, it's more about the education to the general public, which was woefully let down prior to uh, prior to that individual decision. And similar to, I mean, obviously, we saw jump, Trump jumping on that bandwagon with, you know, build a wall, Mexican immigration policy. Yep. Um, and that almost that fear factor that was uh, was generating a kind of public consensus around uh, kind of around it. Yeah, I think is there's a sense in which the political class has to rebuild trust with those people. When I've spoken to some conservative politicians who are thinking of running for president in the United States, and I've said, look, your, your job is not to go out and say build a bridge. Nobody will know what that means. Your job is to provide some proof points like the community college example, like supporting work that show you get it and that you're not simply talking about a corporate tax cut or deregulation as desirable as those might be. You're not really speaking to the core issue. It was ironic to me that while Trump mined that vein of gold, he discovered it and he mined it. If you look at Trump's actual policies, they either were standard issue conservative policies like a cut in the corporate tax or deregulation, any conservative Republican would have done that, or they were just perverse, like the trade barriers that actually hurt these people. So, you know, I, I think we need somebody who will provide more proof points, not metaphors. Isn't that a, I mean, coming back to the kind of this topic this 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 core of the subject here you know the kind of role of fear and the role of opportunity fear spreads more quickly um in terms of so and i'm coming back to technology here which is kind of social right. media bad news spreads more more quickly whereas opportunity is the uh doesn't do the kind of large media kind of companies have a, have a part to play in this in terms of those snapshots of public sentiment you know the build wall or, or kind of uh, and Brexit was a great kind of great example of that, which there's a big focus around immigration. How do we how do we, how do we create a better information loop back to you know the young uh, of of today? Well, I think part of it uh, is really back to proof points. So think about opportunity. When conservatives talk about opportunity, they usually think of Bill Gates. So we need to have more entrepreneurs. We need to have policies that affect entrepreneurs. When I speak to conservative politicians, I remind them, I too would love to have more Bill Gates or Steve Jobs or people like that. But that's not who most Americans are. It's not a reasonable aspiration for them. We need to celebrate ordinary opportunity too. The person who just wants to improve his or her skills in what they do, or the person who was doing this job that's been diminished and now wants to do this job. I think the more we can celebrate that kind of 
ordinary opportunity with real institutions that give it, opportunity starts to become more real. I think the public associates the word opportunity with, oh, these guys are talking about making it more open so that Facebook can be bigger or that Disney can have a bigger market. And that doesn't necessarily ring true. So I think the celebration of ordinary opportunities is very, very important. Have you got examples of countries that have successfully uh, kind of implemented kind of policies um, in response to a major kind of economic um, disruptive um, technology that's come kind of, I'm sure, so I'm sure you do is more of a question instead of kind of leading yeah. to the question. That. Well, it's, it's actually a hard, it is a hard question. Most of the examples that I give in the book are actually historical from different changes, the shift from agriculture to manufacturing and manufacturing yep. to early services. The current, what's different about this wave, and I probably should have said this in my remarks, we've always had change, but um, first of all, this change is more long lasting. So again, when people are uh, becoming redundant, it's not over a business cycle frequency, it's for good, unless yeah. they change. Uh, it's fast. So it's not something like the uh, technology in steel that was a story from the 1960s, 70s, 80s, decades to play out. We're talking about things that can happen in a very few years. And both for the UK and the US, its damage is geographically concentrated. In the US system, that actually matters because of the way we set up the political structure of our legislature and how our president is elected. Geographical concentration of harm is, is a real problem. So I think in, in that sense, it's different. And I, there are not many contemporary successes. I do talk about regions in the US in the book. And when I mentioned Youngstown, the, uh, to the east of Youngstown is Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania which was also, Youngstown is in Ohio. Uh, the Pittsburgh, like Youngstown, was an epicenter of the American steel industry. While Youngstown is primarily a museum of the past today, Pittsburgh is a thriving city. And Pittsburgh business leaders starting in the 1960s came together with university leaders, politicians, wealthy individuals to say, look, we've got to reinvent Pittsburgh. And they did. And I point a number of cities in the United States. The state of Massachusetts was another example that used to be dominated by textile mills and now is dominated by high technology. The partnership uh, between MIT, a very elite American university, with local business leaders was a, a, um, a tonic for change. And so while it's hard to point to national success stories, there are enough regional success stories that we can start to get the ingredients of What's the role the state needs to play? What role does um, local authorities need to play? And then what role do business people and university leaders need to play? That's kind of that, that kind of role of collaboration, really. Um, yeah. But then the interface between um, collaboration between countries, and then how do you preserve the national interest? And that's the, I get it, that's the, that's the, is that, well, is that the natural tension in terms of national Well, that's, I mean, a, a place in which that's flesh, of course, is China. So China, at least as far as American policy is concerned, can't be wall or bridge. It's probably going to be a bit of both. So I was one of the economists who pushed government very hard to US government very hard to admit China into the World Trade Organization. And my logic was the prosperity from openness would be seen by Chinese leaders as very beneficial and they would do what they could to secure it. That of course has not happened. Uh, and so I think that the US would have to think about whether China really should be part of the same trading order that we would normally have with Japan or the European Union or the United Kingdom. That said, I'm not sure we care um, that children's toys get manufactured in China. I think we probably care a lot about certain defense mechanisms. So I think this is all going, what's open and what's closed is going to be nuanced. I get nervous both about my original argument from the 1990s. Oh, yeah, let China in. I'm equally nervous about arguments today that say decouple and wall off China. It's too big. This isn't Russia. It's, some, it's a, an economy plugged into the world too much. So I, 
I think this is one where there's going to be a bit of wall and a bit of bridge. Yeah, so I mean, China is a fascinating discussion, especially kind of within the semiconductor industry as it stands at the moment. We've uh, involved in a number of companies that service that market, and you know, you know the, the world's woken up to the fact that there's too much of the world, too much of the world's technology is controlled by China. So therefore, we need to innovate ourselves, which is, in my view, a positive thing, which means re reinvestment back into the, those kind of economies. Oh, that... I agree. The problem when I mention. Um... Greg Mankey's argument about potato chips and, and computer chips, part of what economists miss is a lot of what's innovation happens on the proverbial factory floor. It's not uh, a brilliant earth shattering idea, it's incremental improvements of things. Having that production is the source of that, much as a great doctor, medical doctor, by his or her rounds becomes a better doctor still. It's not all theoretical. So I, I do think this is important. The way the US has implemented this in the so-called Inflation Reduction Act, which really has very little to do with inflation or the CHIPS Act, I don't think is the right way to do it, but I think the objective is a good one. Yeah, it's, uh, I couldn't agree more about that innovation point in terms of the, um, in the UK, we've seen a lot of manufacturing close down as, as a result of cheaper um, uh, manufactured products from um, you know, kind of from China, um, and seeing some of that return back to the UK, which then creates the innovation itself, which then kind of prospers the economy. But then that's the kind of like nuance behind, I suppose, bridges and walls, right? Because right, you've, right. Got, you've got to create a bridge, sorry, you've got to create a wall to uh, kind of encourage some of that to come back. But then the other side of that is, um, you know, bridges are much more beneficial for both kind of for, for both economies. Well, and, and just to, to say a bit more on that, I think there's not enough introspection, at least in the United States, on the walls, we build unintentionally, perhaps, that cause that problem to happen. So, for example, regulatory issues, um, corporate taxation, a lot of things led to that. And we ought to take a hard look about what policies at home are more likely to promote the world that we like. Companies didn't decide to leave the United States in some fit of peak. The compared benefits of location and I think we, we need to rethink it. I suppose we yeah, agreed. Um, I suppose we're running short of time. And uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts in terms of, I mean, a hugely thank you, first of all, so much for your sure. insights and, um, and especially given your background and for members of the audience, um, I believe you served as the chief economic um, uh, advisor under Bush for, for three years. Um, what advice would you give to yourself back then as you are sitting here today? It just just to kind of round this, to kind of round this out, especially based you know, it, on the it's it's a terrific question. And to be candid, I think it's to notice. You know, going back to the Queen's question at the LSE, I, I think when economists wall themselves off from actual business people, actual workers, actual participants in the economy. We miss a lot, and I don't mean simply at a human level, although I think that's important. We miss a lot in terms of what our models need to suggest. So I, I think noticing, I should have paid more attention to uh, the president's wheeling West Virginia speech than to just my own freshman economics textbook. That's brilliant. Well, uh, thank you so much for sharing uh, your time with us. Uh, sure, of course. This early morning. Uh, on the behalf of the Economics Research Council, um, you know, we're immensely grateful and honoured that you've come to give us a talk. Where can we, um, thank you. where's the best places we can find your book? Um, can we buy it directly on? Uh, on you your can, website? it's a Yale, the publisher's Yale University Press. You can buy it on Amazon or through uh, Yale University Press. Makes a fantastic holiday gift. So if you want to buy early thousands of copies, I'm all for it. But <laughs> where do we get a signed copy? We'll have to uh, make sure. Exactly. Any oh, any time. I'll use that. Well, look, yeah. Glenn, thank you for your time. Uh, My pleasure. Have a brilliant rest of the day. And looking thank forward you. to Thank you. You too. Okay. Enjoy the evening. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Okay, bye.